Our speaker for today is John Krajewski. On just a few housekeeping rules before we start. This webinar is being recorded and we will circulate the recording within 28 to 48 hours. You are all in listen-only mode. During the course of this webinar, um, you can paste your questions in the, in the control panel to the right of your screen. The duration of this webinar is about 50 minutes with a 10-minute slot for Q&A. So with this, I would like to hand over the reins to John. John? Thank you, Santosh. Um, welcome, everybody, uh, to this webinar on Edge to Enterprise, HMI SCADA, and Industrial Internet of Things. Um, so I am John Krajewski. I'm the Director of Product Management for the uh, Aviva HMI and SCADA portfolio. And I would like to start just by quick introduction of who is Aviva. So we start talking about uh, Aviva. Aviva is a, a leader in industrial software in the marketplace, uh, focusing on kind of three major areas, engineering, maintenance, and operations in the industrial space. Uh, today's focus area is going to be in the area of operations. Uh, we have a... Uh, a, a significant portfolio that covers the area of Internet of Things, edge computing, human machine interface, SCADA, enterprise visualization. And this portfolio was used across a variety of industries in the marketplace today, whether they be hybrid, process, discrete, infrastructure, and virtually any vertical that sits out there in that space. Um, based upon market studies showing we have the uh, number one market share in the industry and we have well over 2 million licenses out there in the world being utilized today. Um, the focus of today's uh, session is really going to be in those areas of our portfolio that have gone under the brand of Wonderware um, and we'll be talking about those in a bit more detail. Before we go into the details here, we're going to kind of set the reference point here that you know today's technologies are changing rapidly. There's a lot of exciting things that are coming out of the marketplace today. Uh, many of them that you see up here, whether they be things like artificial intelligence, cloud computing, mobile technologies, um, they're you know in introducing a number of trends in the marketplace that you see out here. Whether they're going to be you know Internet of Everything or those types of things, and we're seeing. Many of our customers that are taking these trends and adopting them to uh, drive value within their organizations, whether it's you know experience or competitive agility on their side, focusing on collaboration and breaking down silos in their organizations, and it's and it's an exciting time um, for anybody who may share my nerdness with regards to this. It's it's really really a very exciting time in this industry that's that's fostering a great amount of change. Right. When we look at these things and the types of changes that we're seeing, we're seeing a very rapid pace of change. We're seeing a very big shift in landscape where, you know, maybe 10, 15 years ago, people would just install software and let it run and leave it be. But now we're starting to see more services and cloud computing and cloud capabilities and integration coming together, um, as well as an evolving set of users where the people who would be utilizing our software in the past were largely focused on operations. Now we're seeing across an entire enterprise a need for people to not necessarily have access to the traditional software that operates was using but needing to have access to the information that's derived from those software applications and with so much change in in these areas we recognize that we had to not only look at our products but also our commercial model very differently and so you've probably heard already we've announced last year our flex program our flex program is a subscription model that facilitates access to our entire portfolio um, through a, a set of credits in essence you can utilize those credits for any one of those um, components of the entire Aviva portfolio, not just the operate component of the Aviva portfolio, um, but also that we have taken different commercial models here. So when we look at the way that we uh, have our commercial entitlements within Flex, you know, their unlimited use of servers and their server-based entitlement, and there's uh, a lot of capability that just unlocks uh, of so much potential with potential within an organization facilitates access to cloud service capabilities and they're all built into one mechanism that we call flex um, and this commercial model is in recognition of those changes that I was talking about earlier so when we start talking about the offerings here uh, keep this in mind that you know we're very much changing not only the products themselves but also the commercial models which are used to be able to access those products all right, so let's get on to the part that I think you'll find the most interesting. We start talking about 
the, the, the key things that we're doing in this space. So we're in the midst of our 2020 releases. So for those of you who may be using our, our software in the marketplace today, we're currently mostly delivering our 2017 versions of our software. And this week, and actually today, we're entering our release candidate for our 2020 versions. And that, should, that usually indicates that we're about a month away from having them available in the marketplace. So overall, for the umbrella of all the, the entire portfolio that we're describing, we're calling this our edge to enterprise operations. And our edge to enterprise operations kind of focuses in three kind of key areas. Those software pieces that sit close to the asset, those things that are mission critical, needs to run autonomous, very often needs to be embedded down at the device level. We're also separated into things that we refer to as the higher level in the, the control room or the unified operations center. Sometimes these sit still, um, still in the operations technology area or in those OT networks. Um, and sometimes these things are shifted uh, directly into the IT networks when the focus is more around integration of information technology and operations technology. And we start also looking at how do we facilitate access to those uh, mission critical pieces of information across an entire enterprise? So when we take down these three areas and we start looking and breaking them down here, we take a look at the things at the asset location. You'll have those physical assets. You'll have those fixed position workstations. And you know, more and more increasingly, we get the advent of mobile technologies. And these things are all supported by our portfolio that sits down that asset location, where we have our classic in-touch HMI, which has been running in hundreds of thousands of locations around the world as at that asset location, providing local workstation control. We introduced it Viva Edge, which, which goes even deeper, and we'll give you some use cases throughout the course of this presentation of why it makes sense to integrate a Viva Edge with our other components as part of a common solution, facilitating, again, this uh, full spectrum of, uh, of access that, are, that is being depicted here in the image. When we look up into the control room space and the different types of use cases there, we start having more cases of maybe cross-functional subject matter experts that are working together to, or, to or drive the operation to optimize the output or optimize the schedule or the things that are a part of that process, ensure that they're uh, getting ahead of disruptions in the process and the key, uh, the key outcomes that they're looking to deliver. And when you look at the portfolio components that we have there, um, it's centered around a Viva system platform. Now, there are many other components which are complementary system platform, but system platform itself as its core is comprised of the root pieces of application server, the historian, the communications driver set, as well as our operations management interface. And I'll delve into these more deeply as the presentation proceeds. When we look up into our edge space here, and we have a recognition that now we start talking to more and more people that maybe are in this office network, so what I referred to as this IT networks earlier, and we have to make sure that there's ubiquitous access into wherever those people sit, and so our focus here is in the area of cloud and Aviva Connect. And with Aviva Connect here, we have a, a core couple of components that are part of the operations portfolio, which are focused on integration studio and insight. And the key intentions here are to put these into the hands of whether they're workstations, web access, mobile access, provided wherever your organization has people that have access to this type of information, but it's in a different form. In this particular case, these people are very rarely not, they're very, rarely going to operate the asset. They're not going to be changing the state of equipment. They're not looking to acknowledge alarms, but they are looking to leverage that information to, to make higher level decisions, decisions that may be um, more focused on business outcomes and maybe not so much focused on the day-to-day -day operations, which happen down in that asset location and to some extent in the control room and these unified operations centers. So moving forward here and talking about these, and let's start taking these apart individually. And when we integrate these all together, we certainly have a, a fantastic outcome. And we're, we're going to start talking about the individual parts and how these things come together. So I'm going to start at that asset location with Aviva Edge. Aviva Edge is, in, is now introducing something that's uh, very exciting for us. It's leveraging what we call industrial graphics. Industrial graphics is a common graphic format that we're going to have across our entire portfolio not just where in touch or system platform, but every aspect of our portfolio where process visualization is being leveraged. It's gonna take a, uh, 
multiple decades of capability that we have brought together into a world-class mechanism, um, which we refer to as the most powerful HMI engine in the world here, and we're calling them industrial graphics. You see a list of different capabilities on the left here, which is in essence intending just to give you a, a view into all the things that are just part and parcel of every system that uses industrial graphics. They're all going to be able to use those connector points or graphic wizards or element styles or all those core components of that and not just the runtime capabilities but also leveraging it from the same editor. What you're seeing here is our edge editor for 2020 and it's been restyled and reworked a little bit here and we'll see a new screen type which is an industrial graphics screen. That industrial graphics screen here is uh, is actually showing you the ability to use industrial graphics with the same editor that you use in InTouch, the same editor that you use in System Platform, and the same editor we use across our entire portfolio. So if you're already using one of our tools, extension of that and utilizing this in those uh, embedded runtimes that we're focused on with Edge um, becomes natural, becomes native, and it's completely web-based as you go forward. Another key aspect of improvement for our, our edge solution here is in the area of MQTT. Now our existing tools already have the ability of publishing an MQTT. Um, and if you're not familiar with MQTT, it's a Internet of Things protocol. And the major values of MQTT start with the uh, data transmission, where typical poll response uh, data transmission has a very heavy bandwidth utilization. With MQTT, it's a publish subscribe, and what that often results into is as much as an 80 to 90 percent decrease in your network bandwidth use. So if your network bandwidth costs you or you need to push more information through, this is typically where people start with MQTT, but its potential goes into far greater places. So with Sparkplug, what it does is it takes the basics of MQTT and puts an industrial flavor on it. And it allows you to now formulate that data in a way that's more discoverable across your entire system. So if I take a look at an example here where I've got a windmill here, and this windmill has a couple of pieces of information. Maybe it's got dedicated transmitters on it that are accessible in some format, and maybe it's got uh, PLCs and devices there that have information available in another format. We're able to take those kind of proprietary mechanisms as well as open standards and bring them in uh, to Aviva Edge to be able to normalize that data stream there and push that up into a broker uh, which is published there in this camp, in this spark plug format and then be able to consume that information into other systems. And the example of one of the systems here is system platform, where we're able to take that information that's discovered at the edge, if you will, and push it up and persist it all the way in through that system platform application. With the release of the 2020 edge offer, we will have a full MQTT publisher um, that has Spark Plug B support. And we're very excited and for the abilities that this brings, not just for the optimization of data transmission, but we're now starting to see this being leveraged in different ways. Where we're starting to see people say where they may have used dedicated networks that were uh, satellite or radio are starting to transition and leverage things like 5G networks instead and using public networks with encrypted data packets that are utilizing things like cloud hosted servers. We're showing the MQTT broker, sometimes broker and server are used interchangeably in this description. It can be on premise, it can be a dedicated machine, or it can be into the cloud. And what we're seeing is a lot of people who have large geographically distributed applications are looking at things like um, uh, MQTT as well as um, the, these emerging public network speeds uh, and, and looking at these things and how they can bring these together to facilitate the access of more data more efficiently through, through these systems. And so this is kind of one of those things that's driving those messages around the Internet of Things inside of the industry. Um, and we're very excited to see this, uh, this, this further adoption of this capability. Now I'm going to shift gears a little bit and start talking about InTouch HMI, which was another one of the components we described as being at that asset location. Um, again, this one sharing is, is, is uh, under formerly under the Wonderware brand, and it is now completely part of the Aviva family. And when we look at InTouch, one of the most exciting things that's happening in the 2020 release is in the area of web capabilities. 
you know, we've had web capabilities through InTouch with a technology we've called InTouch Access Anywhere for some time. But the key difference here of what we've introduced is we no longer have a requirement for remote desktop services. We now can do these things with a very minimal footprint on a uh, client operating system. So you could use a bare Windows 10 with an industrial PC, and you will now be able to uh, deliver these things as native web capabilities so it's not going to be an image that's remoted over there it is actually a full html5 native system where it's going to be rendering on the far side so that allows you to have a minimal footprint on your server because all of the uh, clients are doing the rendering so you don't actually have to do the rendering on the server where it's being located so it allows you to have a very minimal footprint and it's very exciting stuff now we've been introducing in touch web capabilities since our 2017 update one release which was a few years ago and in this particular case we've we're really now kind of finishing off that broader story i'm going to show you this in the way of a video where we've taken our demo application and we've reworked it here um, a little bit from a branding perspective and we're going to show you it running in a browser so it's going to start off here running in a chrome browser and then that browser will be set to full screen and it'll look like basically any other in-touch application. So here you'll see I'm running in a Chrome browser. We've just set that browser to be full screen, and now I'm navigating. So that's one of the new capabilities of being able to navigate between content. You're also seeing me clicking on some buttons, which allows me to do write back. Also based on full security, full permissions, full HTTPS as part of this. We have full capability for things like alarms and alarm controls, being able to do acknowledgments based upon the permissions of the user who's logged into the system, being able to access any type of your existing content, your existing applications, you can bring those forward in here, you can bring those graphics into this system, and you're able to leverage even some of the late breaking capabilities we've introduced with regards to situational awareness and dashboarding capabilities. We're, we're really excited to put this into the hands of more and more customers so that they can start doing some different things. So beyond being able to do just basic HMI type capabilities with the, with this web capability, we recognize that there are other types of scenarios that we can unlock for our customers. So a pretty common use case we see out there is where our customers are utilizing uh, very low cost TVs that they can put up around their plant and these TVs often have a browser built into them. And how could we use that here? Well, we can use that in terms of something we call an, a carousel. A carousel will actually take that web browser and push up just a few selected symbols, and then it just carousels through them on a rate that you that you define as part of the uh, the web browser widget that we have as part of this. And what you're seeing here is basically it's just going to go ahead and carousel through them. So if you have this on a TV, you don't have any dedicated hardware for the TV. You don't have to have an industrial PC or some other type of a device out there. If the TV has got a browser built into that, you can just link it up to this particular URL, and it'll go ahead and it'll carousel through so that you can provide that um, line level signage down onto your applications and that are all being facilitated from one common source, which is that core in-touch system. Other use cases we see around here are revolving around mobile. So we're introducing two new mobile applications, one for iOS and one for Android, will allow that'll allow that remote in-touch access. Um, so you don't actually have to go and find out what's the URL to that browser, excuse me, what's what's the browser, what's the URL, I have to figure out a way to type in uh, my applications. I can store my credentials with this application, select from a list of applications and bring them up here um, directly to my mobile device. Uh, so this will facilitate mobile users of all different types uh, to have access to their traditional process graphic data inside of InTouch. So very exciting experience that you'll see from InTouch there. We recognize that these new capabilities also needed us to reconsider our commercial models. So we're introducing something we're calling InTouch Unlimited. InTouch Unlimited kind of comes in two flavors. You're seeing them here depicted on this uh, the second and first or the second and third tiers. So we're going to start with InTouch Unlimited Standard. What is that? Well, with InTouch Unlimited Standard, it gives you unlimited access to web client connections, unlimited access to those native, native mobile connections, unlimited access to RDP connections if you prefer to use remote desktop protocol, as well as InTouch development. It provides you the maximum amount of tags, and so while today that remains at 60,000 tags for InTouch, 
when we increase those things in the future, you will automatically gain access to those new amounts of tags that we uh, we have um, as part of that. All uh, all of our I/O drivers and full redundancy. So when you when you uh, bring this into your application, you don't have to worry about well, how do I set this up redundantly? It's part of your entitlement. It's part of the solution for InTouch Unlimited, and that's the standard tier. When you look up at the professional tier for InTouch Unlimited, we then combine it with our world-class historian, our historian clients, as well as insight on-premise, and be able to provide these things so that you now not only have your real-time access to information, but you have all the analysis and reporting capabilities that are necessary throughout your production systems. So I'm very, very excited about introducing this InTouch Unlimited and the potential it's going to unlock for our customers. So now we're going to take a step forward and talk a bit about System Platform. System Platform has been a capability that we've introduced into the marketplace. Oh, wow, it was already in the mid-2000s that we introduced System Platform. And at the root of System Platform is an, is an object model. And objects, those typically represent those assets in your applications. And sometimes we refer to that as our digital twin or our operational digital twin. One of the things that we're seeing here is that there's an ever-increasing scope of what those needs to be represented, not only in the things in the software that we're adjacent to, but also inside of our system itself. So, for example, if you look at the classic components that sit on the information side of a system platform object, you'll have things like attributes, the pieces of data you connect to, alarms, history, and logic. And while traditionally what we had observed is that many of that data is coming from a device. Let's say you have a PLC or a programmable logic controller and you connect to that and you're pulling data out associated with that asset. Well, that is, was very typical in the past, but now we see that very often that information you're pulling from may be coming from other software packages, may be coming from web services, may be coming from uh, standalone devices and transmitters and those IoT type things that I was describing before. So the system platform object is increasing in scope to not just those physical replication of the, the PLC or the RTU or the DCS that you've traditionally connected to, but you need to bring in data from a variety of other systems and System Platform has made that very easy for our customers. We also see it not only on the information side, but on the interface side, the part that you tend to interact with. And we look at this from a multiple of, of uh, angles, where you have windows, and that's starting from the bottom, windows and faceplates and symbols, but content is kind of like the next real emerging space that we see, where I'm not, I don't, in the example I'm showing here in the image behind there, there's a three-dimensional model. I don't want to have to send through all of the binary data for the three-dimensional model. I just want a link to have access to that three-dimensional model. And whether it's a three-dimensional model or if it's a maintenance record or a production schedule or whatever is associated with that physical asset, this is what we link through with content. And you bring all this to, together to form that object model or that asset model and often referred to as your digital twin. Now, when you bring these together, we've introduced some new capabilities along the way to make it easier to manage. One of the things we've recognized is we started to see that uh, these applications are growing at scale. It's not uncommon for our customers to have applications which will have hundreds or thousands of objects. And within System Platform, everything is built from standards. We start with a template. Your template has those attributes, graphics, scripts, content, and other pieces that are associated with the template. And then if you make a change to the template, any of those instances of this template will inherit that change if you've defined it that way. So you can determine which aspects change and which aspects do not. Well, we're starting to see customers which tend to have hundreds of thousands of these objects. And with that, we recognize the need for us to invest to improve the uh, performance of that change propagation. Because it's not just pushing the change down, it's also validating that change. So there's a, bit, a lot of business logic that has to happen there. And we've made a steep investment so that we can get those processes happening very rapidly. It's not uncommon that we have customers that have people working uh, many, many at a time simultaneously on an application. We have some customers Customers that may have working between 10, 20, 30 people simultaneously in this applications, constantly evolving them, adapting them, and improving them over the course of their uh, of their days, weeks, and months that they're working with these systems, making these systems move more quickly, more move more efficiently, is or no, absolutely improve their overall productivity. Um, so we're very excited to introduce these new check-in times. 
Now, back in 2017, we introduced something called Operations Management Interface, shortened here to just OMI. And it's always been designed for us in our thought process in mind is that how do we converge data? So I was mentioning to you earlier that links to external content. And this is how it kind of manifests itself inside of OMI or Operations Management Interface. Everything is driven through context associated with an asset. So when that asset links out the content, whether that content be a map or a web page or historical data or any of the traditional components that we've mentioned here, um, they all become part of a data-driven system. Our vision for where this will happen in process visualization going forward is less assembled and more automatically occurring. Right? So we expect that in the future that because I know where that data resides, I bring the data forward and I use a data-driven model to assemble applications. And then as I use my applications, I use my applications based on context. So context basically will surface any of that related information based upon the user interface you've decided it to do. Um, when I select it. And so you're seeing here a variety of different types of information that has been linked to the asset that's currently here selected or tank 300 is selected and they're showing a variety of asset types of data. And now we're seeing some new ones even down going down and looking at even the PLC logic and its current execution. And I'll come back to that in a moment. But the key focus around OMI is to be able to link these things and these things are linked through what we call apps or OMI apps in here. And we're continuing to expand our extensibility here into other types of content. So a couple of things you'll notice here is that the grid I'm showing here, that's a that's a standalone grid that, that can either be in form of .NET uh, win forms or it can be in a WPF form. And on the left-hand side, the thing that you just popped up, that's the InTouch web client. And it's actually embedded into one of the frames there. And I can actually go full screen on that as necessary. These are all now just core components. If you want to bring in any piece of third-party content, we have the ability to ingest that and utilize it just as if it were a native app. But we're continuing to invest in our native apps as well. Here's an example of our native application on an area we're investing is that we're finding more and more customers who want to develop a single application and have it become responsive. What you're seeing is our layout editor. Our layout editor here, and you're actually selecting between different form factors and how you can adjust your content based on that form factor. So you're seeing here how at the same application, when it's brought up in different form factors, it's actually adjusting itself. And it's all done through that responsive layout editor. The responsive layout editor um, focuses on a, what you see is what you get, sometimes just shortened to WYSIWYG as you see on the screen here, but allows you to design your application for a target device in the way that you see fit. Um, it's a very uh, intuitive mechanism in the way you work uh, as part of this, and it delivers you a, a very uh, a very easily accepted application across your user base. So regardless of where they connect to it, I was showing you earlier in that edge to enterprise, you have so many people connecting from a different set of devices. You can't divide, you, do, you don't want to have to force one user interface upon everybody, and you also don't want to have to redesign your application over and over. And this responsive layout editor is a core way of making that possible through a common application that you don't have to rework and redesign consistently. Looking at some of the new apps that we're delivering here, and this one's actually an update. So our map app is one of our um, one of our first apps that we delivered, and it's a, it, it completely embraces this data-driven model. Where on the back end, all I needed to do is give it a list of assets, tell them where those assets are located, located, and then tell it what types of graphics I would like for it to put on those as map pins, and it automatically just assembles everything for you. It's pretty much magical when you get it going. Um, one of the things here we've seen is that uh, more and more of a need for customers to be able to use on-premise servers that were uh, that were secured and so we've been working with a lot of our customers and, and looking at how they can integrate their GIS layers on these systems and securely connect to those systems with credentials that are not um, that are not just linked into that. So what does that mean? We don't want to have credentials stored as a clear text. And so here we're able to store credentials in a safe manner so that they cannot be um, extracted or seen um, going forward. And it's not even just obfuscating them in terms of the entry point, but where that data is stored and how that information is accessed um, as I'm working between different, um, different user interfaces and different points of contact inside of the system. So we've made some significant changes and the changes 
changes we made for the OMI app are actually going to be shared across all applications as well as our SDK for applications that other people have built on how you can handle things like single sign-on or permissions and passing those through in a secure manner. We've also updated one of the other apps that's, that's seen a lot of progress and that's our content presenter. If you've not seen the content presenter before, the way that it works is that you can point it at a point in your navigation model, which is typically the asset model you create with your, um, your objects inside of the system. You can point it and it will look across either that asset or any of the ones above it or below it, or you can, you can determine how you want that to behave. And then it just goes in and it collects a lot of information from that, like the graphics, and it just puts it into a either a row, a grid, a list, or however you want to see that. So in the top image here, you're seeing the uh, you're seeing a list of key performance indicators, and those are all uh, shown as uh, spark lines and some symbols here that are listed here. And as I select through my navigation model, it'll automatically just go and find those key performance indicators for the assets that are in those areas, and it puts them in a list. Here it's putting them in a grid that can be scrolled um, in a similar list down here. The key thing here is that um, it all just automatically makes itself happen as this data-driven mechanism that I was describing. You focus within OMI on your navigation model and on your uh, on your content, and the application itself uh, adapts to that based upon its current context. Some of the other applications that we're introducing here is, again, I'm going to come back to that PLC Logic Viewer and give you a little bit more details on what that really entails. PLC Logic Viewer, in initial release, will support the Rockwell RS Logics 5000 series controllers. And what it, in essence, allows you to do is, based upon the context that's been set, it will navigate to um, it'll navigate to coils inside of the system. So what is the use case here? We're not trying to program the controllers from this application. We just want to provide visibility. The typical use case that we hear from this is that if uh, if there's a staff person who's working on an asset and they're down there working on a uh, on an asset and that asset is interlocked, very often that the reasons for that asset being interlocked may not be evident to the to the person working the asset. And very often what happens is that they may have to call in engineering to have to identify the cause of the interlock. Then engineering has to uh, go pull a laptop from the pool, find the PLC files for that system, load it all up just to identify perhaps a safety door wasn't properly engaged. What this allows the operator to do is to be able to quickly look in terms of what has been interlocked, why is it interlocked, identify the issue, and self-service uh, where it makes sense in par in par as part of this. We're quickly going to be expanding this as soon as we can into, uh, into accessing more different types of controllers. Um, clearly looking at Schneider Electric and Siemens is kind of our next major focus here. Um, but we wanted to get this into the marketplace and prove it out to ensure that um, our basic use cases are, are delivering the value that we expect to have here. Um, and this will be part of our 2020 release. And so very excited to have this as part of our, our, our portfolio. Here's another one here that's been uh, it's been really uh, generating a lot of enthusiasm across our customer base. And it, it, it pairs up with our Insight offer. So I'll talk a little bit of an in, uh, insight later, and I'll just give a quick preview here. Insight has a capability of, of, of doing something we refer to as unsupervised learning. What it does is as you feed insight data, it will automatically try to find that um, information about that data. There's simple cases. A simple case of a news page is uh, of a news story that it can provide you is that, hey, look, this particular value has never been this high. Doesn't mean it's an alarm. It's just going to say this is the highest this value has ever been or the highest it's been in a particular period. It can say it's the lowest, it's changing quicker than it's ever changed before. Uh, you can identify things that are multivariate as well. It'll also say, okay, well, I know these things are in associated areas and they tend to move together. Let's say, for example, that um, if this valve position and this level in this vessel tend to move together, when this valve is closed, the level tends to be still, meaning that you know it's not draining. But what happens when the valve is closed and now the level is moving? Well, that might indicate a leak. You don't have to program it in to go find leaks. It says, well, normally it doesn't do that, and it can surface this information for you automatically. So let's get back to the OMI app. The OMI app that I'm, I'm, I'm showing you a preview of here will, uh, will automatically surface those stories contextually. You select an asset, it will show you a list of stories for that asset. You can then rate those stories, determine whether or not they were useful. And it will then prioritize the ones that you have identified as being more useful. And over time, the system just gets smarter. It gets smarter and smarter about the information it can present to you. And 
and you can score it and so you ensure that you only get information that's for you that is of value we want to ensure that this isn't just becoming a nuisance we didn't want to have another list of information you constantly had to deal with um, but this helps you to kind of understand and become much more proactive and it's part of a bigger scope and vision we have to our, towards driving these and the future won't be just the total unsupervised learning but you'll also be able to go into insight and be able to create um, these uh, artificial intelligence algorithms yourself by point and click on uh, on a set of predefined algorithms and you can actually uh, direct the types of stories that you want to have come out of this so it's a very exciting capability that we have here and again part of our 2020 release scope other aspect of system platform that we're adding here is a OPC UA server. Now we've had OPC UA client capability across our portfolio for a number of years, and we're starting to see, especially with things like the Industry 4.0 movement that we're seeing across the globe, more and more people wanting to have access to not just historical data, which is where typically most people in our systems would just gone would have gone to our historian, pulled a SQL report out, but now we're seeing more and more people want to have access to a real-time data stream and potentially they want to be able to write back to that from higher level systems. They may or maybe want to adjust set points or do other types of things um, from higher level systems. And that OPC UA has become one of the key mechanisms to make that possible. So with the 2020 release, we'll have a complete OPC UA server uh, that allows you to full access to uh, data, all the data types, you can browse models, has security built into that, um, and that becomes part of the overall system platform story um, when purchased on subscription. Another key aspect of the uh, communication servers that is part of system platform is going to be an MQTT OI server. Now, I mentioned earlier how Edge is also going to be a uh, a broke, excuse me, it's a publisher that allows you to put, publish things in spark plug format, which is the latest specification around this uh, Internet of Things protocol. Well, if you don't need a full standalone autonomous HMI at the edge, you just need something to act as a gateway, the MQTT OI server can fill that role for you. So you can bring data in from existing HMI SCADA systems, which could be ours, could be third party. You can bring it into any OPC sources, PLC, OPC UA, embedded sources, dedicated uh, transmitters. You can bring those all up and push them up to the broker through one system. One of the major value points of our OI server is that if you ever have a data loss, it queues information locally. Excuse me, if you have a connection loss. So if your network experiences some outage between the a server and the broker, you will queue information locally and then it will store and forward when that connection is restored. So you have an, an assurance that it's not losing data. Now you'll see on the other side of the broker, on the north side of the broker, we also show the OI server and that's how we're able to pull information from any broker back into our on-premise solutions. Now, I mentioned these as on-premise solutions, but many of these you can actually host in the cloud as well. But when it comes into our dedicated HMI SCADA solutions and different packages that we have, or directly into our other types of um, solutions like the historian, where you can ingest direct data directly from the, uh, into the historian. So this MQTT OI server really becomes uh, very much a jack of all trades, if you will. So you can connect anything into it, publish it up to the broker, and then use it on the other side to pull information down and push it into any one of our systems or any other um, consumer that needs to pull that data in. We recently introduced uh, another aspect of our communication servers and our communication drivers, which was our, our Viva telemetry server. This brought to us a world-class DNP3 and Modbus telemetry capability. Um, and with the 2020 release, we're also going to be adding support for the IEC 60870 uh, protocol. And one of the key things that's different about this one is because there's um, so much a focus on demand reads, you'll often get data out of sequence. So when you say, I need to know the data, the, the data right now, as you may be also in the middle of streaming data from a history buffer that's coming out of that source, um, and very often you use this in very widely geographically distributed applications, we have remote telemetry units on the far end there. Um, and in this particular case, we can fully handle that um, out of sequence data and it doesn't affect or uh, adversely affect anything with regards to this history sequencing or the alarms or the alarm generation. Everything gets handled properly inside the system um, with the full support for this whole protocol. So that Aviva telemetry server, um, which again is already available for DNP3 and Modbus, gets extended um, uh, with this IEC protocol as well. 
One of the things that we've noted is that with the introduction of operations management interface and the increase of scale with system platform and this focus on integration of the operations technology with information technology, we're seeing uh, what we're referring to as a unified operations, sometimes called system of systems, where people are looking not just across those classic systems, which is kind of described here in that gray box on the left there, but all the activities that people are now looking to do across those systems and how they need to source information from a variety of other applications in order to make those decisions. And often this is sometimes referred to as IT and OT convergence or system of systems, but this unified operations is becoming something that is an evolving space in and to itself. And we're recognizing that for many of our customers who need to, who are working in this space, they're looking for us for guidance in a specific industry vertical. One of the areas where we started initially was in the oil and gas space. And we're seeing some example of how we're being able to pull a lot of that information together into one um, unified operations center that crosses a function, a cross-functional area um, across an entire operation. This particular solution that we took into market last year won the hydrocarbon processing 20 th 2019 award for best process and plant operations optimization technology. And it was encouraging because we have a number of, uh, a number of customers who are engaging on this and we're starting to move much more quickly into this and providing information that's already directed towards that industry. We're moving further into unified operations centers with a number of releases that are planned on top of our 2020. These will be scaled out over the next several months, and there'll be more and more of this that you'll hear about, whether it's in water or data centers or airports and other areas of infrastructure. And those are, those are key focus areas for us, but you're going to hear more and more around these unified operations centers, which takes those core technologies. And I've, just been, I've spent a lot of time over the last half hour or so talking about different ways we're adapting our technology. And it and it puts in those uh, those applications, those targeted capabilities for those specific applications. So it really comes down to not just being able to have a set of tools that can be used for any application, but we've kind of built a lot of the application content and example templates and systems that can be utilized together. It's been a, a very exciting space for many of our users in these industry verticals. We've also been talking earlier, and I showed you in my image, this Aviva Connect. Aviva Connect is the name of the Aviva cloud systems and all the, the systems we have here. And with our focus here, it's on frictionless end-to-end -end workflow. So what does that really mean? Well, traditionally, a lot of our on-premise applications and our mission-critical human-machine interface applications have been uh, focused on usage where we work with either a system integrator partner or the engineering department within a customer, a customer organization. They build out a custom application, and then they manage this and service it over over time. When we start looking about distributing information across an, or, uh, across an ecosystem, there's, they're going to be, have to be much more free-flowing. They have to be self-service. And that's kind of the main point of this frictionless end-to-end -end workflow, is facilitating usage across an organization in a very self-service manner that doesn't require um, a lot of specific expertise. Um, and there's two different ways of this, um, whether it's self-service of tools or self-service of applications. So I'll give you some examples here. So we have two major components that the uh, that the monitoring and control portfolio is contributing to Aviva Connect. And the first one we're calling Integration Studio. Integration Studio is a capability that's been into the marketplace for several years. And in essence, um, what it allows you is and it's part of the Connect system. So here's the connect.aviva.com front end. And you'll notice in the lower left-hand corner, there's a section that's targeted focused at the developers. And inside there, we have Integration Studio. When you connect into Integration Studio, you can set up your own projects, which are groups of machines. You can load up those groups of machines, any of our traditional software. So if you need to put System Platform or InTouch or any of those pieces of software on there, you get to up and running. So that if you're, say, a system integrator and you have 10 customers who are running 10 different versions of products, you don't have to maintain all that virtual infrastructure and those virtual machines. You can, you can go to Integration Studio and put those things in there. With the 2020 release of Integration Studio, we're going to be having the entire portfolio of components. So major additions here are going to be additions of Edge as part of the uh, of the Integration Studio, as well as our SciTech SCADA is also being integrated um, introduced into that um, into that system as well.
but we're expanding integration studio we're not just going to be focusing on uh, some, using it for virtual machine access to uh, virtual systems but we're also going to be utilizing it to do things around managing those common graphics. We mentioned earlier these industrial graphics is a mechanism for us to be able to share information across um, uh, across different product types. Well, with Integration Studio, we'll now have the ability to synchronize those graphics th with through the cloud so that you can have your standards always in the cloud. So with, 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 with whichever product of ours you're using, whether it's System Platform, in touch, Edge, or whichever product you're utilizing, you'll be able to connect up into that integration studio, pull down your standards so you can ensure that across an organization that you're sharing the common standard for yourselves. Um, and even in the cloud, you can continue to use these in other ways, which I'll show you some examples of going forward. We're starting initially with symbols, but ultimately this integration studio uh, synchronization capability will be moving into many other areas whether they're objects or object wizards or other types of templates inside of the system application templates but integration studio is going to be taking a much more of a center a stage with regards to a cloud capabilities that, that give us extra co coordination and collaboration between people working in systems now I talked about earlier about edge and how edge kind of uh, goes down into those embedded spaces. Many of those embedded spaces may be uh, operating systems like Linux on you know, very proprietary hardware that sits down there at the edge. And we recognize in our conversations with our customers that not only is there a large volume of these that they're starting to introduce in their systems, but it's introducing a, a concern for them, how do they manage them? How do they manage these things in these distributed applications? And so one of the things that we're introducing as part of our integration studio is the ability to package these applications as containers and manage them remotely. So in this case, in Wind Turbine 1, we've added some aspect of maintenance, and that's the red at the lower corner. And the way this works is that we can then ingest that application, package it up into a container, and then we'll utilize Aviva Connect to push that application down. Actually, it's not truly a push. The way it is, is that there's an agent that sits on each one of those remote devices and it's looking at Connect to see if there's a new version for itself. Any of you who has kind of like a set-top box at your home for doing things like, you know, uh, your cable or your satellite, how do they update those? They update those in a very similar manner, where they have a central mechanism that allows them to um, update those systems. So whether it's a case I'm showing here where I've got distributed graphic, um, geographically distributed assets, or if I'm an OEM who wants to be able to upgrade the version of my applications for my customers, this type of a technology will make that very easy for you. You can also utilize this as you can bring this information back through that MQTT the mechanism that I was describing earlier. And again, you can utilize System Platform as a unified operations center. The key thing and the key message I'm trying to push over and over here is that we no longer are looking at this as individual pieces and parts, but one collective, one entire system that works very cleanly together to form uh, greater solutions than were possible previous to that. Now we're going to talk a little bit about Insight. An Aviva Insight. And in Aviva Insight, there's going to be some uh, changes there where uh, our mobile application, which is a dedicated mobile application to Insight, it's different than that InTouch application because this was not focused on access to your HMI or SCADA system. It's this one is focused on access to the data that's been published to Insight. You can publish data from to Insight from any of our applications, and then you can create dashboards in a self-service manner. You can create easy-to-use graphics inside of the system, and then distribute it across anybody who needs that information. We're now going to be extending this, and this will happen a little bit after the 2020 release, so probably closer to the summer timeline, with some very exciting capabilities. We're right now just calling it the Application Composer, where we're not only going to be uh, publishing information up here, but now that I have the information like those graphic standards and those capabilities that I'm sitting inside of um, my Aviva Connect Integration Studio, I can use them to do drag and drop applications, which are cloud native solutions that you can build inside of here. Now, we don't see these initially as being HMI or SCADA applications, but they're cloud applications that facilitate the access and distribution of information to anybody within an organization. And in this case, you're seeing it from end to end, where they're showing exactly how much it takes to build one. So you build a model, you link things to the model, and then ultimately we're going to show it going to runtime. 
but this is a very easy to use system that allows you to kind of take all those pieces and parts um, and, and assemble them into an application. You can use our content or you can use external content as well. Um, this is going to be a very exciting space because we see now that customers can build their own applications that they don't have to host on their hardware, but they can just put them into the cloud and have ubiquitous access without having to worry about setting up VPNs and other types of network capability, um, but still um, focusing also on connecting into their secured Active Directory systems. So very exciting things that are happening inside of Insight. So when I look at the summary and kind of coming back, uh, uh, all the things that I've been describing, whether it's things at the edge at the bottom here in uh, IoT View is a, is a runtime type of edge, whether it's in touch or system platform connect, you can see that we're really addressing this and going forward as the end-to-end -end system addressing all types of edged enterprise capabilities for our customers. Now, we don't expect that everybody has to use everything. The, po the parts that are in important to you are the things that you use, and you, you you pick and choose those things. So I could use Edge with directly with Connect, or I could use InTouch directly with System Platform, or I could use IoT View directly with System Platform. I don't need um, to have every piece and component here. I use those things that are right for my business, those right things, the things that are right for my operation, and we're staying focused on ensuring that we drive that innovation. Driving that innovation comes in a manner of forms. We've talked a bit about commercial innovation, using things like unlimited clients, unlimited points, unlimited history. All of those things that you're seeing from those flex models are driving those commercial innovations, driving technical innovations. Hopefully you've seen a number here that whether it's HTML5 or containers or MQTT or Internet of Things, driving those technical innovations, but also driving those innovations from an area of experience. And one of the ones I'll highlight here is things like free e-learning. So we are going to be making a change to our systems where all of our e-learning modules, starting with the 2020 releases, which should be available in a month or so, will absolutely be at no cost. So you'll be able to go through all of our e-learning modules for InTouch, for Edge, for system platform to make sure that everybody in your organization is up to speed on all our capabilities um, without having to en engage in any uh, commercial aspects of that. So there's a lot of things going on, a lot of excitement. It's a very exciting time for us here at Aviva and we're Really, really excited about what we want to do with edge to operate, um, edge to enterprise operations. And probably the one thing that I'm looking forward to the most is putting this in the hands of our customers, letting them experience it, showing us where we've done right, showing us also potentially where we've made you know, uh, missteps so that we can correct that and stay focused on the future. Because this isn't a one-time exercise. We recognize that systems aren't gonna be where you put them in place once and you let them run for a decade. Systems constantly have to evolve. You constantly have to adapt and the pace of change, whether it's technology or capability of software, needs to make that possible for you. And we need to make that something that we strive toward. So we have an entire network of services, support partners, uh, training uh, implementations and system integrators that are here to help you. I mentioned earlier that we are now in release candidate for 2020 and that's something that you can engage on immediately if you're interested in. You can reach out to your distributors. You have, a, you can, if you don't know who your distributor is, you can go to a, a viva.com and find out who your distributor is and they can actually help you to have, gain access to that release candidate and start educating you more on this capabilities of 2020. I'm sure that I have created as many questions as, as, as answers as I've provided because I've really just given a small sampling of all the capabilities that we're introducing. But hopefully you found this as being a, a very engaging and interesting session that will help you get some ideas of ways that you can apply these technologies in your businesses going forward. With that, I'm going to invite back our moderator and ask him if we have any questions that we can answer before our time concludes. Great, thanks, John. Um, Umar, if you can direct the questions to John, thank you. Yes, John, we have a question that, uh, can I continue to use InTouch for system platform or is OMI the only client option going forward? Excellent question. So when we introduced OMI, we introduced it alongside InTouch for System Platform. And for those who may not understand the question, InTouch for System Platform is a client to System Platform. We built OMI as a native client to System Platform, but it works alongside InTouch. So when you buy a license, we issue what's called a supervisory client license. It works both with InTouch 
and OMI. We are continuing to support InTouch as, for as long as InTouch exists, it's going to continue to be supported with System Platform. But our area of investment, our focus for improvement, is on OMI. So if you have a system today, it will not have any loss of capability. But in terms of uh, leveraging these data-driven mechanisms I was describing and the apps and all the things we were just uh, talking about there, um, that is where OMI is possible. But today, if you have InTouch and you want to look at OMI, you can use. You don't have to buy anything else. You can start looking at OMI slowly over time um, and and run it side by side with your existing in touch for system platform we also have a question john when will industrial graphics be available in cytex scada cytex scada is actually part is absolutely part of the story um it actually pained me a bit to not have it be part of here because the timeline's a little bit longer so cytex scada we expect to be part of this uh industrial graphics story before the end of the year the we also have a question, is the MQQ, MQTT broker functionality simple, uh, similar to a OI server and is there plans to make your own broker? We are currently working on making our own broker. So the, the difference here between OI servers and MQTT brokers, um, if you're not familiar, is that typically a um, in traditional protocols, it's point to point. So I have the I have something which provides the information, something which consumes the information. But the, the this notion of MQTT has kind of like third parties. I'm a publisher, I am a broker or a server, sometimes they're used interchangeably, and I'm a subscriber. So if I've got a point out here, I can publish it up to that broker, and that broker then handles whoever needs that information. It just does, It doesn't give that information to everybody, only those people who have subscribed. So today we're focused on the use of third-party brokers and we support a number of third-party brokers and we are working to um, to create our own. That's probably a little bit more in the timeline here, um, but we're continuing to, to support a number of brokers in the market line, in the marketplace. Thank you. The next question, John, is does the PLC logic viewer with OMI have to be programmed or does it work directly from the PLC? So the PLC logic viewer, you have to point it to um, a, a the logics file. So the I think it's called the L, L5X or well, I'm, I'm not 100% sure what that extension is. You do have to um, point it at the file and we're actually working with some partners that can actually ingest the file and, and have those things created. And so we're looking at that as kind of a longer term story. But for today, you will have to hand, um, you'll have to hand it the file and point it to a file where it can um, get that. And so we can point it on our own, on our own server place a copy of the file there and that's how we get the logic in the comments. We also have a question in terms of connectivity. Can the OI server pull tags directly and build those tags directly from the Rockwell PLC automatically? Yes, yeah, so we introduced, I think that was two or three years ago, auto build into our, our, into our ABC IP driver and their ABC IP driver supports the control logics. So we can go in and discover all those UDTs or user defined types, create templates inside of our systems automatically, as well as create the objects and place them into the, um, into the model and system platform. So we can create all those things automatically inside the system. With our tag based system, we also have mechanisms that you can create the tags directly. So absolutely, this is a capability that we support not only for uh, Alan Bradley, but there's a mechanism for as well for Siemens and Schneider Electric. Okay, just a few more questions. Uh, with the introduction with, uh, of the InTouch web client, is there also plans for InTouch Access Anywhere and will there continue to be development on the InTouch Access Anywhere software? So InTouch Access Anywhere um, is absolutely part of our near-term plan as well because we recognize that there's a transition period. Not everything you do on your standalone client is going to work inside the web client. So there'll be things that we've done for years, like whether it's ActiveX content or other types of proprietary content that's not native web. I mentioned to you earlier that in order for us to gain scale and gain that small footprint, that it's a native web capability. So many of the technologies that we can integrate into our into our clients were not web, were not web technologies. So if you need to access those in a remote manner, we still are going to support in touch access anywhere for the foreseeable future. And I don't see any reason why we wouldn't do that. Um, and, and investing, ensuring that probably investing it to the degree of kind of cleaning it up, making sure it stays up to date with regards to security best practices and 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 the like. Um, well, our major area of investment will really be on maturing that web client, the native web client. Just one or two last questions. Uh, are, are the new 
mobile apps applicable to system platform users or only in-touch standalone users? The mobile apps, that's a great question here. So in-touch, as I mentioned here, and it was actually a part of the questions I would just hear, does in-touch still work with system platform? Absolutely. So I can take that in-touch mobile application and I can point it at system platform. So absolutely, if you're an in-touch user, mobile apps work for you. If you're a system platform user, the Zoom in-touch mobile applications will work for you. You would just point in-touch at the graphic package that you're using with inside a system platform and it can create a, a simple little web application for you that way. Just one last question, John, as a follow-up to that. For legacy in-touch applications that do not use orchestral graphics, will they be compatible with in-touch mobile? With So the legacy system applications that do not use um, orchestra graphics or what we're now referring to as industrial graphics, those um, we introduced back in 2014 R2, which is a number of releases, um, the ability to convert the legacy graphics to industrial graphics or orchestra graphics as they were known at the time. Um, so you can convert them and it's pretty lossless. I think the only things you have to worry about is potential ActiveX because industrial graphics don't support ActiveX moving forward. But the bottom line here, is that um, anything that's a native graphic in terms of an animation link or data connection or those things, um, you, you can use those. I think that's it. Thank you, everybody, for your time today. I really hope this was beneficial to you, and we really can't wait to get this into your hands. should be in about a month. Great. Thanks, Umar. Thanks, John. And thank you, everyone, for being a patient and attentive audience and we hope you've got as much as you wanted from this webinar and I wish you a good rest of day. Thank you all.